Hi, everybody. Welcome to Humane Voices, the official podcast of the Humane Society of the United States. I'm Carrie. Hi, Kelly. Nice to see you again. How are you? Lovely to see you. I'm excited about today's show. Yeah. Uh, So we're your host for today's episode. And uh, today we are naming names. Um, Just a little context before we get started with our fabulous roster of guests. Uh, One of the many ways that we work to get at the root causes of animal cruelty here at the Humane Society is by engaging some of the biggest players out there the corporations whose practices can sometimes impact literally millions of animals. And some of those companies over the years have shown a lot of willingness to engage and work on their standards, you know, things from what they sell to how they treat animals directly to how they source animal-based materials and lots more. And some of these corporations are, are, you know, willing to hear from animal advocates and learn how they can do better. And some of them... Not so much. And so we've got some leaders from uh, three of our big campaigns to talk about which companies out there are uh, are maybe in the not category, uh, to put it mildly, and uh, really should be doing a lot better to be to be more helpful um, and move their standards for animals. So I'm going to go ahead and without further ado, uh, in- introduce our fabulous guests. Um, today we have Carla Dumas, Vice President of the Farm Animal Production, uh, John Goodwin, Senior Director of the Puppy Mills Campaign, and PJ Smith, Director of Fashion Policy at the Humane Society of the United States. Thank you everybody for being here. Thanks for having us. All right, everybody. So as Carrie said, we're naming names. Gloves are off. We're ready to rumble. So Carla, I'm going to start with you. Tell us a little bit about Farm Animal Protection, what you and your team do. Yeah, I'm happy to. Thank you, Kelly. And thank you, Carrie. Excited to be on here. So from a global sense, our global focus on farm minimal work is centered around reducing the number of animals who are killed for meat, egg, and dairy products, and also end the cruelest production practices. So when I say production practices, our work is designed to put an end to extreme confinement. So what that means, it includes hens confined to cages for egg production, mother pigs confined to gestation crates, and chickens raised for meat that are bred to grow so quickly, they're confined to bodies that are often unable to withstand this rapid growth. Now, as it relates to what we're talking about today, part of this work to eliminate these practices is done by engaging and negotiating and Carrie, like you mentioned, working with the largest, oftentimes global corporations to enact and follow through on purchasing policies for their eggs and pork, buying cage and crate free sources, and purchasing chicken from producers that are transitioning to slower growing breeds, enrichments within their industrial barns like lighting, bedding, as well as more humane slaughter practices. Great. Thanks, Carla. So to lay some more groundwork, I'm going to kick it over to you, Mr. John Goodwin. Tell us about what you and your team does. You know, at the Humane Society of the United States, we are the only one of the large organizations that has a full team dedicated to stopping puppy mills, which is kind of amazing if you think about it, because it is such a major issue. And right now, our focus is on stopping the sale of puppies in pet stores, because most puppies in pet stores come from puppy mills, And while the mills themselves are largely concentrated in these Midwestern states with large agricultural economies where big ag does everything they can to stop us from getting even an extra square inch of space for a mother dog in a cage, well, they've got to sell those puppies somewhere. And so that's where we have the lower hanging fruit, where we can really tackle this industry by shutting off the problem on the market side. And we do that with a mix of legislation, undercover investigations, being an information clearinghouse, educating the public, helping people find humane sources of uh, dogs for their, you know, for their next four-legged family member. It's a really robust, multi-pronged approach that's having some real results. Thanks, John. So from farm animals to puppies to PJ, what do you have for us? What are you and your team up to and how are you saving animals? Hey, everybody. Um, Pleasure to be here. Uh, The fur team, I mean, we are looking to end the fur trade uh, as we know it. And HSUS has a really, um, as JP mentioned, like a multi-pronged attack, but we we really hope to close the markets for these fur products. I mean, there's just like no humane way to raise a a wild animal in a cage on a, a fur factory farm. And, and so we were working with some of the biggest companies um, around the world, the biggest fashion companies to go fur free. We're also working in cities and states to ban fur sales um, for new fur products. And so that's uh, California, which it, 
is the was the largest fur seller in the United States. They sold upwards towards a quarter of the fur sold in the United States, banned fur sales starting the beginning of this year. And so that's no matter if the company sells fur or not, they can't sell fur in California. So we're closing those markets. And what's really cool about that is um, the profit margin for these fur farms is so razor thin that if you can lower uh, the demand for fur products just a little bit, those fur farmers aren't making any money. And so they have to close as well. And so um, we're seeing the, a rapid decline of the fur trade um, around the world because of this, this approach. Before we circle back to Carla, I think we should have acknowledged uh, with PJ that we have here uh, the recent uh, Neiman Marcus. What what we can't call you a centerfold, right? For their uh, for their Christmas catalog, but right yeah. up there. <laughs> it, it, it's uh, my dog Franny and I got to go to, to do a real photo shoot in New York City with Neiman Marcus, and uh, we're in the the holiday catalog this year, which is really celebrating our work and in the Humane Society. Um, it's really cool. I, I don't generally like to be in the front like that, but uh, um, Franny looked good. I was glad to be by her side. But you'll take one for the team. We appreciate you and <laughs> exactly. thank you for your service. Yeah. yeah, and and that's that's because of all the great work you've done on these issues, right, PJ? I mean, like it, it's it's something that Neiman Marcus did because you know we've we've had a longstanding work with them, correct? Yeah, these relationships. I mean, uh, JP and Carlo can can vouch for that. These relationships take time. Um, you mm -hmm. got to build them over the years. Um, there's a trust there, and and once you get to that point where they they understand that you know their customers care about animals, and you can show them that uh, they they generally want to do that good thing because they know they can do well by doing good, and, mm. and we're seeing that across the board. Yeah. yeah. So how long have you been engaging with, with Neiman Marcus at this point? I've been at the Humane Society of the United States for 14 years, and I've been mm -hmm. engaging with Neiman Marcus for 14 years. And I can wow. tell you, it always hasn't been a wonderful conversation, but mm -hmm. we got there um, through the years. And again, it's about building that relationship. And, Absolutely. And you you got to play the long game sometimes. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. And as we often hear, you know, for all of our listeners or consumers, we're all consumers, you know, we vote with our dollars. So I think it's an interesting point, too, that um, when companies do what the market demands and what consumers want, it can be a, a win win for everyone. So, so, all right, we've talked about some good shout out to Neiman Marcus. Carla, what are some companies that you and your team have worked with that maybe, um, or companies you've identified in your experience, they could be doing a lot more for animals. Let's name them. Let's get them out there. Yeah, yeah, happy to. Starting things off to kind of piggyback off of what PJ was saying. So going into the work that we do and, and all of us do here on uh, the podcast today, our goal is to work with these corporations to enact this change and ensure that they follow through with these commitments. So obviously we're motivated to make this happen because it's the right thing to do for animals. And what PJ said as well, corporations are recognizing more and more that this is what consumers want. So I will say that, you know, we have been for nearly 20 years working with many corporations that are doing better for farm animals and making progress. So I do want to highlight, of course, that there are many corporations doing that. But what I would say as well, and what we're here to talk about, is there are corporations or producers that appear to be committed to keeping cruelty as a standard practice when it comes to what we're doing. So I would say from the work with our farm animal protection team, the worst offenders would be Walmart, Kroger, and Tyson. So I would say, and if you want me to go into more details with this, I would lump Walmart and Kroger together in considering the worst when it comes to their cage-free egg policies. And, you know, for context and going a bit deeper into that, when we ask corporations to purchase cage-free eggs, we're asking them to eliminate the most abusive practice for hens in the industry. 
The animals spend the majority of their lives confined to a space barely larger than their own bodies. So when we say cage free, that means the wire cages are removed, allowing them to engage in more natural practices Mm -hmm. like foraging, perching, nesting, walking, and of course, spreading their wings there. So I want to be clear that when we are asking this in the process here, oftentimes the hens are still never given access to outdoors, natural light, and are in an overcrowded barn. So it's not a sanctuary by any means, but it's a vast improvement to the conventional practices. So starting off with Walmart, uh, we actually began engaging with Walmart back in 2005. And in 2010 was the first change that we saw. They moved all private label eggs, meaning their Walmart brand eggs, to cage free. In 2015, we worked with them to continue many of their animal welfare commitments. Unfortunately, what we saw since 2015 is that Walmart has reversed its commitments to go Mm. cage-free on eggs and crate-free on pork. Mm -hmm. And they've also gone back, shockingly, on making their private label eggs even cage-free. So that was a transition that they had, and they've since reversed that. And throughout our continued work with Walmart, they pledged to do internal work to develop plan for cage free and just continue to no longer follow through. What I will say is that over the last two years, with the progress that they're reporting, they have roughly increased cage free eggs by 1%. So meaning at this rate, Walmart will reach 100% cage free in 79 years, uh, which their current goal is for 2025, which clearly they're not going to be able to reach at the rate they're going there. So it leaves very little little confidence on our end that they're taking this seriously. Very similar with Kroger. Uh, They made a commitment to go 100% cage-free by 2025 and have since reversed that promise. Mm. One thing that I did want to note about Kroger that is a little bit different as well, there was polling data that was published earlier this year by Data for Progress. And not only is Kroger not following through with their commitments, but they are also misleading the public with the company's marketing of caged chickens versus cage free with their egg sales. So, so what are they doing public- there, Carla? Like, <laughs> like, what's the misleading things that they're... So what the polling showed was that in in looking at a lot of questions with a lot of the, if you imagine going into a grocery store and seeing the eggs as you're going in there, oftentimes labels will show happy hens or outside or different deceptive words that can be included. So it's leading consumers that are looking to make those changes and purchase more Mm -hmm. humane products into thinking that those products are higher welfare or cage-free when in fact they're not. So there is actually a class action lawsuit that is looking at what Kroger is doing within the misleading information uh, as well. So we certainly will continue to follow and see what happens there. But I will say, you know, with different grocers such as Costco and Target that are switching or actively switching to cage-free, we just feel that Walmart and Kroger do not act like companies that care about the treatment of animals. Wow. And so you said you've been working with them, Carla, since I think in Walmart 2005, you've been working with Kroger. And so you're continuing to work with them. So it sounds like if if they, you know, said, okay, we're going to, we are going to meet that 2025 deadline um, and reached out to you, you know, you'd continue those discussions, do whatever it took to work with them to highlight that. They're just, they're much like we said, PJ's playing the long game. You know, uh, they are playing the long game. And as I think in your words, I thought that was interesting, keeping cruelty as a standard. Yes. So Carla, do you have a sense of what caused this? I mean, it sounded like Walmart was heading in a good direction and then started drifting back. Like what, what is it? I mean, that, that sounds mm-hmm. like a, a team that sort of wasn't actually prepared to play the long game. And, and, you know, did they have some sort of shift at the top or was there, do you have any sort of insights into that or? 
There's a lot of factors that can potentially play into those changes. Of mm-hmm. course, turnover, um, depending on who is overseeing procurement and those changes there. Certainly looking at the industry and um, challenges that come up. However, there are a variety of companies that are um, able to and showing that this is something that can be done. So a lot of those are just excuses for not making this a priority or listening to what consumers are wanting. And um, I would say that oftentimes as well, uh, thinking about profit margins and what that looks like, you know, obviously we don't want to talk about that, but certainly in thinking about supply and demand. But what we do know, again, if companies like McDonald's, which is nearly 100% cage-free at the time, if they can do it, or for example, the largest food service companies like Aramark, Sodexo, Compass Group, if they can make these changes with the amount that they're purchasing, grocery stores like Walmart and Kroger can absolutely do that. Yeah, yeah. it's been yeah, it sounds like they can scale. Yeah, there's certainly companies that are doing it, you know, whether Target or Costco, you you mentioned earlier. So yeah, so thanks, yeah. Carla. And yeah. um, John, I know you've got somebody on your list, you know, oh, that you're yeah. just ready to share that are uh, maybe not the best actors in this. Yeah, arena. well, of course, for the Puppy Mills team, I don't think it's a, I don't think we have to do a massive drum roll, a lot of suspense. I think- But let's, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Did it, John. Yeah, it's, of course, Petland, uh, the largest- chain in the country that still sells puppy mill puppies, the company that's been sued by countless customers for selling sick puppies, the company that's been investigated by multiple state attorney generals, the company that's been investigated by the Centers for Disease Control for their part in a zoonotic disease outbreak that put customers and employees in the hospital. I could go on and on and on, but they are the ones who will get coal in their stocking this year. Wow. (laughs) Those are harsh fighting words. (laughs) <laughs> and well, you just, just, just got to call the balls and the strikes as they come in, right? Well, I like it. I like it. Let, let's spill all the tea. So tell us, though, John, with Petland, I mean, I, I believe similar to Carla and the company she's mentioned, you've tried to work with them to transition to a humane model, right? So when I was in the animal fighting campaign, my predecessors in the puppy mills campaign uh, had a big investigation they released linking Petland to various puppy mills. And this was a long time ago. This was like 2008. The work continued into 2009. And then Petland approached HSUS and said that they wanted to be part of the solution. They wanted to sit down with us and help reform mm-hmm. the world of commercial dog breeding. And we sat at the table with them negotiating, trying to get some sort of positive results for the dogs for a long, long time. And I came to the Puppy Mills campaign in 2016 and quickly realized that this was a delay tactic. They wanted mm-hmm. to keep us at the table, yak, 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 yak. Right. Reform. Never actually, yeah, mm-hmm. never actually doing anything that led to any results. The USDA regulations uh, for commercial dog breeding kennels or puppy mills say you can keep a dog in a cage only six inches longer than her body. In the nine years that we talked to Petland, the dogs didn't get an extra square inch of space through the USDA regulations, oh. one inch. I mean, it wasn't worth it. So then we started doing undercover investigations in Petland, uh, expecting to continue to link them to puppy mills, but shocked at how many sick puppies we found in their uh, back rooms, even mm-hmm. finding dead puppies in freezers. So now we have a full campaign to convince Petland to stop selling puppies, join all the other major pet store chains that focus on pet products and pet services, embrace a humane business model. So that's what we're trying to get them to do. And John, if I can, just real quick for listeners that maybe aren't as familiar with this issue, when you talk about Petland being, you know, not a good actor in this space, but those pet stores that maybe have pets in the stores, but they are different than Petland, just a a quick hit on kind of differentiating that for consumers. Yeah, well, so there is a big difference between a store like Petland or any of the independent puppy selling stores that have glass display cases filled with lots of puppies. And Another business whose profit comes from the sale of pet products, but they host adoption events, they work with rescues and shelters to get homeless animals out the door, et cetera, et cetera. I, I will say that this, this puppy selling business model, this is not this is not a problem that's limited to pet land. Any of these stores that have mm-hmm. 30 glass display cases that they want to be kept full with puppies all the time, a lot of different varieties of different breeds, they're not going through a Rolodex with 400 responsible breeders trying to find who has a litter 
available. No, no, no. They're going to some mass producer who can keep a reliable supply of puppies in the stores. And that's why almost all puppy uh, pet store puppies come from puppy mills. Yeah, it's like it's like treating treating dogs as widgets. Like who's the best widget supplier? Oh, yeah. And, you know, when you look at like these little uh, they have these state associations for these puppy mill owners like you know, Missouri Pet Breeders Association, that kind of thing. And when you flip through their little newsletters, they refer to the dogs as livestock. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, they see them as agriculture commodities, not as family family members. So, John, and, and you know, after these initial sort of dialogues with Petland, it seems like since then they've sort of gone into such into more of a fighting us at every turn mode around legislation and things like that. Is that correct? Yeah. So one of the uh, really exciting things that I saw emerging when I came to the Puppy Mills campaign and and I've tried to really double down on was the passage of these local ordinances that prohibit the sale of puppies in pet stores. Uh, There are about 480 localities now that have passed ordinances like that, now seven states. Petland is freaked out by that. So they are spending millions of dollars to try to pass their own legislation that would take away your right to petition your city council to pass an ordinance regulating pet stores. They want to take away your right to fight puppy mills through your city council, to petition your local elected officials through these bills that would preempt, they call preemption bills, that would preempt any sort of local ordinance. Petland even requires their franchisees to send in 0.5% of their revenue every week, even if they didn't make any money. They're not sending in 0.5% of their profits to corporate. They're sending 0.5% of their revenue to go to a war chest. Hmm. They have obvious lawyers, you know, message testing, just, just everything they need to fight us. Yeah. Wow, I wish they could invest some of that war chest in taking care of the puppies. That'd be nice. It would be a huge difference, wouldn't it? Yeah. It'd yeah. Be a huge difference. And I want to make sure because it is the holiday season coming up and sometimes people do uh, want to add animals uh, to their family. Absolutely. Uh, I think John's made it clear. Don't go to Petland. Your local shelter, I can tell you, is busting at the seams. And there's mm-hmm. lots of great animals at your county shelter or your private uh, nonprofit shelter. It's a crisis time for shelters, in fact. Yeah. It's not like a few years ago when they seem to be emptying out. So hopefully everyone can find a little little room in their house or maybe you know, one more one more dog, one more cat. Yeah. And, and Petland uh, leaders, leadership, if you're listening, John is ready for that call saying you are ready to transition to a humane model. Yeah, th- this doesn't have to be a hostile relationship forever. If they were to change their business model, uh, we would... We would tell the world, we would we would get to the tallest mountain and scream at the top of the tallest mountain. Look, they did the right thing. Let's support them. I would personally, I, I don't live near a pet land. I think the closest pet land to me is in Pittsburgh. I'd drive up there and buy a few hundred dollars worth of dog food uh, <laughs> and, and treats and supplies and toys if they would make that change. Uh, they're the only one of the top 30 pet store chains in North America that sells puppies. They don't have to do it to be very, very prosperous. Thanks, John. We're here for you, Pat. Land balls in your court. PJ. All right. We know you've worked with that. Uh, let's start. We're going to start on the positive note here. Um, tell us, we mentioned Neiman Marcus earlier. Talk to us about, because you work regularly with these, you know, global companies. Talk about those that uh, have said no to fur. I would say, I mean, I said the long game, but you only have to go back to around 2015, where you started to see this wave of companies um, looking about into their fur policies. And a, a lot of these fashion brands, I'll say, didn't even have any animal welfare policies um, before they started talking about fur. So we we were able to you know get our foot in the door. Um, the Humane Society of the United States passed the Federal Truth and Fur Labeling Act, which just guaranteed that all fur products had to have the country of origin and the species on the label. Um, there was pr- previously a loophole that that didn't allow all fur. And we started seeing, you know, companies selling real fur as faux fur. So we started looking, working with the FTC, working with these brands um, that eventually led to that federal law that closed that loophole. Um, but by working with those companies, we got our foot in the door with some of the biggest brands around the world. We started talking about um, just the way animals are raised for fur. And then we also started to show them that this is something that their customers cared about. And it was around 2015 where like Armani, Hugo Boss went fur free. Mm-hmm. Um, and a couple more trickled in that led to Gucci in 2017 announcing, I mean, it was Gucci. One of the- now, is that a new brand? I, I don't believe we've heard of that. 
Gucci's uh, been around for a long time. It's a, yeah. is it a joke? Okay, yeah. good. Um, <laughs> I didn't know who, who were you talking to. It's but... the straight face, Kelly. I only buy luxury, PJ. <laughs> only luxury here. I know all about it. Yeah. But it was. It was one of the hottest brands in the world at that time. Yeah. And so they took that opportunity to announce that they were going for free. And ever since then, I mean, it's most fashion companies at this point that are that have for free policies and and they've even it's almost like a competition of who's the most humane fashion brand Mm, because they started banning exotic skins now um banning angora um which comes from from rabbits and Mm -hmm. um so it's these these animal welfare policies are getting stronger and stronger but it started with fur um, so, I mean, what's really great is there's only a handful of companies left that still sell fur and which leads me to the, you know, the, the worst offender at this point. Bring and, it. Who do you yeah, have, BJ? It's uh it's a company. It's the largest luxury company in the world. It's called Louis Vuitton Moet Hen- Hennessy. Um, they, they also sell a lot of the fancy spirits, um, that mm. you see out there, but, um, LVMH is, is for short, but they, you know, they're. They're the brand they represent, or they're the parent company for Louis Vuitton, Dior, Laura Piana, and Fendi, which is essentially an Italian uh, furrier. Um, and they, they're owned by, I think he's the second richest man in the world right now, Bernardo Nolt. Um, but yeah, it's just this really large luxury company that um, has yet to take that, that, that step in the right direction by, by going for free. And there's a couple reasons why i think um i mean they're on the the naughty list um the first one is just simply their business model um so go back to gucci gucci's owned by a company called caring uh, which is like the second or third largest uh, luxury company in the world and caring gave all of their brands which is like alexander mcqueen um saint laurent gucci it gave all of their brands autonomy to to make the announcements do the do the announcements that they want and so those brands were able to trickle in by going for free um which eventually made it a really easy decision for caring to say we're for free because all their brands had already made that announcement lvmh doesn't give their brands that autonomy so we know, I mean, I've, I've met with several of the, the companies that um, are owned by LVMH, and we know that they're for free. Um, they just ha- aren't able to announce it. And what, what, why that is a problem is because when these companies make these announcements, it's such positive feedback. Yeah. That all they want to do is do it like more. They want, they love that feedback. They love hearing from their consumers. And I mean, when Gucci went for free, this is like one of my favorite things to tell companies is when Gucci went for free, it was one of their most liked posts on Instagram of all time. Mm-hmm. Same with Prada when they went for free. It was their most So it makes financial team. financial sense for these companies sure. to do it in right. addition in brand to brand sense. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. These companies are spending millions of dollars on social media with influencers and ads. And all they have to do is say, we're doing something good for animals and they're going to get the most likes. Um, it's a it's an easy decision at that point. But LVMH doesn't even allow their brands to take that simple mm. step. So they don't they don't know how good it could be. Are they just digging in their heels? I mean, at some point, yeah, have they engaged? Like or... what's, there's clear evidence other companies have done this and it's successfully. You know, yeah. Yeah. They've done yeah. it. It's a win-win. What it, are they just being obtuse? What is why aren't they just transitioning and doing that? I wonder. I think there's a couple of reasons. The first one is um, they've kind of sided with the European fur industry. Hmm. Um, they really, they they got in their corner. They defended them, even though there's no way to defend it. They're, they somehow try to say European fur production is somehow superior to um, fur uh, production in China and other countries, but it's exactly the same standards. So it, it it makes no sense. They just are trying to say that one's luxury, the other one's not. PJ, um, wasn't we, some of the European farms where, where, where we saw, you know, viral it, outbreaks during the pandemic too? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's where COVID, it's a breeding ground yeah. for COVID-19. Avian flu is going through fur farms like wildfire. Um, yeah, and, and very Finland gross right places now. to be. Yeah, so it's, the other the other reason is also that they own Fendi, which I like I said mm-hmm. is essentially a, a furrier. 
Um, the good news is Fendi at one time used to sell a lot of fur, but they've diversified their products quite quite a lot in the last few years where you can go on their website right now and there's maybe 10 pieces of fur where previously the whole website was just covered with fur. Um, so they're, they're, they know where their consumers are. They, they, they're headed that direction, but they're doing it very, very slowly. Um, and I think, I think with fur production really leaving Europe at this point, um, we're seeing over, like, I think there's 20 countries that have banned fur production. There's a European citizens initiative that's happening right now that will essentially close all fur production in Europe. Um, that that those talking points that LVMH used to say that European fur is the only fur we buy and it's it's luxury and things like that is just not going to hold up anymore because they're going to have to if they're going to source fur anymore they're going to be sourcing it from China which is the largest producer of fur in the world um, and so I think that that's that might be the key that will eventually allow them to go fur free so we're really hoping that this uh, citizens initiative will, will be successful. And of LVMH, their uh, kind of probably most popular known brand is Louis Vuitton, you said? Yep, yep. Louis Vuitton and then um, Fendi and Dior are really their mm. main ones, but they own other ones called Givenchy and, and Laura Piana, um, mm. some of the lesser Loewe. Um, yeah, so they just, they own a lot of companies. Um, and like I said, a lot of them are fur free. They just won't allow them to be for free, um, which doesn't allow them to promote it. And they won't they won't get all that positive feedback that I think uh, that they they would deserve if they they took that step. And I'll also say it's just like this idea of luxury has changed in in that this 10 years since, you know, Gucci went for free and, and Armani and Hugo Boss and. Luxury now means who's the most innovative, who's mm. the best on the environment, who's the most ethical, um, which always wasn't what what luxury meant. And so, I mean, if LVMH truly wants to be luxury, they would be innovating the next generation of faux fur. They would be, you know, we know that fur is one of the worst materials for the environment as well as animals. So they would be taking a step to move away from that. And that sounds like they're so it. behind the times because at one, you know, years ago, uh, wearing fur was iconic and seen, seen as a status symbol. Now, I mean, everyone knows whether you're in the animal welfare movement or not, you know that if you're a celebrity or a person, you're on a stage or you're known to be wearing animal fur versus faux fur, like it is not a good look. I mean, it is a small fraction of people, I think, that think that is, is wise. But luckily, there's lots of other companies that people can shop for, you know, for the holidays or any time you mentioned some of them, Armani, I think, um, did you say Burberry? Uh, Burberry, is Versace yeah. one of those? Yep. Um, yeah. I'd love to see what they define as a, quote, luxury for a farm versus a non-luxury for a farm, because I bet they look awfully alike. They look exactly yeah. the same. Yeah. And I have a theory that uh, for fans of music, there used to be a lot of references and songs to some of these luxury brands, Louis Vuitton. I know Kanye West referenced it, but in more recent history, you've got Bruno Mars with Versace on the floor. So it also makes good sense, perhaps in the uh, the music world to sing about these companies that are, uh, you know, doing well by animals. I like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Only good companies we could sing about. Yes. <laughs> So PJ, if they if they called you tomorrow, what would you do though? Oh, just like JP, I I would go buy all my my suits from uh, Louis Vuitton. No, um, <laughs> right, hey, PJ. None of us can afford rolling? to shop these brands, <laughs> but if other, if our listeners can afford to shop these brands, consider not. <laughs> no, no, uh, no. Scream it from the mountaintops. We would we would celebrate LVMH. Um, you know, as as the company that's just that's taking a step in the right direction. Um, we would you know be able to just they would the feedback that they would get they would immediately get a bounce i know when nordstrom went for free their stock went up mm -hmm. as a result like wow. this is real dollars that they can they can benefit from from going for free because this is just where consumers are at and i can tell you like, even we're, we're meeting a lot with like investment um um and financial institutions now 
which are creating fur free policies. So they will no longer even fund companies that are associated with the fur trade. And because they see the writing on the wall that this industry is just going downhill so fast that they they're not going to put their money in a company that that is associated with it. And so that's LVMH, great. That So it's financially risky for a company to invest in those companies. I mean, at yeah. every angle, you know, the evidence seems pretty clear that that's, you know, what companies should be doing. Yeah. If you look at if you go to Goldman Sachs right now, it will say they're like companies they won't invest when are associated with assault mm-hmm. weapons. Um, like drug paraphernalia and the fur trade. So it's listed right there with with those other things. And so I think, I mean, LVMH would be open its door to more money if they were to go take that step in the right direction and go for free. Well, y'all, thank you so much for being here today and sharing with us about, about these companies that are, that are doing well and the companies that are not doing so well. Um, I think Kelly touched on this a little bit earlier, uh, but you know, we're entering a high shopping season right now around the world. And um, if you are, if you are looking to buy your loved ones uh, gifts, just consider, you know, consider who you're buying from, considering what, consider what they're doing, consider what they're doing for animals or not doing for animals. Um, and make choices accordingly. There are lots of good places to get information about, you know, the brands that are that are on the right path and the ones that are really dragging their heels. And so um, thanks so much to our team for for being here today and talking us through some of the some of the places where headway is being made and where still headway is still to come. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Get shopping. All right. This has been Humane Voices and we will see you on the next episode. Mm-hmm.